Hello, Trash Future listeners. Please enjoy this part one of a two part series on the topic of the libertarian blockchain paradise island of Prospera. Part two is already available on the Patreon. So if you want to hear the second part and find this topic interesting, there's a link in the show notes. It's available. Once again, thank you for being Trash Future listeners, and I hope you enjoy. Hello, everyone, and welcome to part one of a very special two-part episode of TF. It is me. This half is the free one. Yes, thank you, my love. It's, it's TF Investigates. We're all putting on mm. big overcoats and fedoras, and we're all mm. sort of like nosing around with uh, with big magnifying glasses. You have like glasses. BBC World Service theme song, but also like a beep, 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 beep in the background. I'm stroking my cat and saying, like, this is the last time. Uh, one last one. So there we go. Yeah, this is my one last one. Perfect. Well, uh, yeah, it's not Hussein's one last one, it's, unless he has something to tell us. Uh, He's but a no, noir it is, podcast. Um, it, it is TF. It's a two-parter. Uh, I've done the thing where I got obsessed with something and then made a two-part investigation out of it. Uh, so I did the only thing that it's reasonable to do when I do something like that. Uh, yeah, you used the escape valve for your special interest, yeah, I which feel is like, what this podcast yeah. is. And when you're at that point, like you either got to make a two part like podcast series, or you sort of tell a girl randomly at a festival and then become a viral <laughs> sensation. <laughs> and what I have done is I have uh, gotten uh, Ian McDougall, a uh, journalist uh, who has written on this particular uh, uh, subject, uh, to come on and hang out with us today. Ian, how's it going? It's good. Good. Thank you for uh, for having me. Yeah. So the subject today, this this thing that has burrowed its way into my brain. Uh, is called Prospera. And it is, in short, the first, I think, libertarian intentional community of the like eco-modernism type that's adopted Bitcoin as a, as a, a real uh, currency to actually have people that live in it and some buildings. And it is completely fucking insane. Um, Prospera sounds like the girl who bullied you at Cheltenham Ladies College. Yeah. <laughs> I wish. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. um, and Ian, you've actually... You've actually like written written on Prospera for the magazine Rest of World. How would you describe it to a new person? Sure, yeah. And w- when I was there, which is now, gosh, uh, more than a year and a half ago, I guess. <clears throat> uh, you know, it's really it's on an island just north of uh, uh, the mainland Honduras called um, Roatan, which is famous for its like, scuba diving and it's a big tourist destination. Um, and it's like a little part of sort of in the middle of that island, this, um, I forget exactly how many acres. I think right now it's something like 60 acres of land yeah. and all that was on it when, when I was there. And I think still, although they, I know they have new construction plans, um, was basically a sort of main, uh, you know, kind of co-working space office mm-hmm. building. And then a, a few, um, a few uh, sort of housing units. They, they have these modular housing units. Um, would, would it be fair yeah. to describe it as a compound yeah, so it is in the sense that yeah, they, I mean they have a, an armed guard at the entrance. Um, uh, and the, when I when incredible start, fantastic. Yeah, it's this <laughs> private security company called something like Bulldog International or something. Um, mm. It's funny when when we uh, the uh, fixer I was with and I uh, went there with with one of the um, the founders. Uh, you know, the the guard made the, the show of having him show him his ID and everything. Even though it's like there all the time. It seemed like a whole. You know, I'm not sure what they were trying to demonstrate exactly, but. No, no one gets favorable treatment. I don't know. Our libertarian community, we are checking IDs, unlike (laughs) every other libertarian community in the world. (laughs) (laughs) It's it's the property rights thing. I can write to exclude people from here. (laughs) We're checking ID, but only for ID. We're not looking at the age section. (laughs) (laughs) So it's this it's this town that sort of it's this thing that's supposed to be a town that has had these massive ambitions um, on the island, as you say, of Roatan. It actually calls itself a governance platform, and it has had, at this point, hundreds of millions of dollars invested into what is essentially a co-working space with some like small houses around it. Uh, on, on in a, in a really inconvenient location. <laughs> Everyone's going to start somewhere, I guess, right? Yeah. One of the yeah. world's most inconvenient locations. Just a- as a joke, we took hundreds of millions of dollars worth of money to put a WeWork 
at the geographic North Pole. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's it's almost as uncommutable for uh, central London as parts of South London. Are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is it's technically in Zone Two. It's like a weird aberration. Well, I mean, technically, if I'm not mistaken, the Bay Islands were all part of what was British Honduras. Uh, so yeah. yeah, it technically is Zone Two. Yeah. I, I... <laughs> the nearest tube is Tooting Beck, but it's a hell of a bus to the tube. <laughs> So this, oddly enough, Nate, what you said, that's actually a, a thing that they say is a big benefit to them for their like, because oh, I've read all of their investor packs, right? So they say, mm. unlike the rest of Honduras, Roatan was British and therefore is safe and everyone speaks yeah. English. <laughs> Oh wow. wow. Okay. Yeah. I was wondering how long uh, it would be until we got there. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Right away. So, <laughs> yeah. Just, I, I, I'm not going to do a potted history of that part of Central America, but I used to live in Honduras and yeah, I mean like, okay, Roatan and the Bay Islands are safer compared to like uh, La Ceiba or um, Tegucigalpa or um, San Pedro Sula, which are incredibly dangerous cities. But like, yeah, it's it's a tourist destination, but I think that it's pretty common, like what you were describing, Ian, of having armed guards. I haven't been to the Bay Islands, but I've been to similar areas and like every everything that caters to foreign tourists has uh, armed guards, if I'm not mistaken. So in yeah. a way... Yeah, go ahead, please. Oh, is it, you know, it is. It is fairly. Um, it, 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 I don't know exactly what the crime rates are. I mean, they're much, much, much lower than on, on the mainland. Yeah, certainly than San Pedro yeah, Sula. Yeah, yeah, much yeah. Better, not, not yeah. a good comparator, I guess. But it, you know, it never. It, it didn't feel um, unsafe in any way. Really, like it wasn't. There were. You know, they did have sort of a lot of armed guards and stuff at various the sort of tourist hubs. Uh, I was staying kind of a bit out uh, of the way um, in, the, in the sort of like a. They have these kind of like um, just like. Yeah, hotel resort kind of thing but it was just like cabins in the woods it wasn't i don't know like it sound too fancy but they didn't have any kind of security there and it didn't seem like you know they had a couple of dogs that hung around but um it, it did feel like a pretty safe place uh, and it does it is it, most people i think it's it's actually easier to get around there in english than in spanish weirdly it's it's a very kind of peculiar um place yeah. i'm sure i mean wildly different in pretty pretty much every respect from the mainland is my, my sense but um so what yeah. we ask is what does prospera say about itself so this is from their website. They say we are enabling sustainable and profitable growth in partnership with local communities. Remember that in partnership with local communities for what comes next. But they say Prospera partners with governments like Honduras to promote and operate economic development hubs, which are called Zones for Economic Development and Employment or ZEADS. This is going to be big later. These hubs are integrated with local communities, quote unquote, 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 and have semi-autonomous governments and regulation guaranteed by the Constitution. So... You, you essentially have a sort of like Reddit enclave uh, and <laughs> outside your town where you can, you can drive into, you can get your ID checks, mm -hmm. and then yeah. you can be, you can you know walk amongst the redditors. Yeah. You the Reddit enclave emits the white smoke, and then you know that they've picked a new epic bacon. <laughs> no, it's a Reddit conclave. Oh right, the re the Reddit enclave is like the the, the Hanseatic League kind of thing, where it's yeah. like subject to only its own laws. They say Prospera enables entrepreneurs to solve problems structurally and responsibly responsibly for the rest of the world, because its governance institutions have been developed by and for local and global entrepreneurs and business people to institute key checks on governmental power. The Prospera I mean, platform... The thing is, Sorry, go ahead. Th this isn't that different from the way, um, it, it, let's say, relatively, comparatively normal people talk about a special economic zone, right? Uh, is it's it's going to be this area where we, we can do entrepreneurship and have slightly less regulation and therefore be more efficient. Like people talked about Shenzhen that way at times. Um, so what makes this worse? Because I know it's going to be something. Because it had to have been to make you like this about it. <laughs> oh boy, where to start? Um, so it's like a special economic zone is not good, but it is a recognized kind of bad, and this has to be like transformative kind of bad. So basically, right, here's how it works sort of in a nutshell. As I understand it, and Ian, I invite you to correct me if I'm wrong at any point, but the, there is this zone, right? And it was uh, created uh, after a uh, coup against uh, the Manuel Zelaya in 2009, at which point uh, this guy Pepe Lobo comes to power and starts disappearing journalists, outlawing the morning after pill, Appearing in the Panama Papers. Just, just normal yeah. stuff. Just <laughs> normal stuff. sort of desperate stuff. Um, before being praised by Barack Obama for bringing truth and reconciliation to Honduras after ousting who someone who I believe was not even really that far left. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, sound familiar to like anywhere yeah. in the history of Central America. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, but everyone patted themselves on the back when Zelaya was removed because according to the Honduran constitution, which obviously like is, you know, a, a, a plantation economy constitution, he had violated the rules by trying to convene a constituent assembly to potentially consider rewriting it. And everyone patted themselves on the back and they're like, oh, wow, rule of law, like order and democracy in Latin America. And then the Honduran military burst into the presidential palace and forced him at gunpoint onto a plane to Costa Rica. And they were like, oh, whoops. Uh, maybe we spoke too soon and that that the country went up in flames it was it was incredibly destabilized for a while um and then yeah lobo took over and i i don't i i i've lost touch with a lot of under and politics since then but um uh that was the big thing about it was when WikiLeaks happened when all the cables got released like everyone knew that what had happened the coup was completely illegal Mm -hmm. but um yeah, Washington was just sort of like, all right, play along. It's cool. <laughs> yeah, like we're uh, we're like whatever, you know. Like, ah, the guy looks a little too much like Chavez, even though it doesn't look like him at all. So we're fine. And yeah, Honduras. Um, uh, well, I'll I'll stop now. But basically, like the problems Honduras was having with its internal stability, and specifically with regards to drug trafficking, got way, way, way worse during that period of instability, and they never really recovered. Well, uh, and now it's like. Yeah, go ahead, please. Well, what's going to happen, uh, fortunately, is that all of that instability is going to be fixed by the implementation of what Pepe Lobo did more or less right away, which is create. I think, I think it's yeah. I think it's cool how both uh, here and in Venezuela and in many other places in, in, in Central and South America, you literally have the, um, I can't be the only one who thinks that if the troops got together, put a team together, they could dominate the NFL, but for drug trafficking. Uh, <laughs> I, I can't be the only one who thinks that the military of this country couldn't like absolutely blow the cartels out of the water in terms of like drug trafficking efficiency. Well, so before getting involved in all of that, um, what happened was uh, he came up where he basically like watched a TED talk by Paul Romer and then get very gets very interested in this idea of charter cities, tries to pass it with the Supreme Court that he inherited from Zelaya. They say, no, you can't just give away bits of the country because you think I it would be good remember. for the economy. I remember charter cities. Yeah. Charter mm-hmm. cities, the idea was uh, Paul Romer, he's like a, a, a Nobel laureate in economics, right? And I, yeah, very I've talked smart before guy, about yeah. how the Nobel Prize in economics isn't real. But um, <laughs> it's not. It's genuinely not. It's it's passing itself off as a Nobel Prize. Anyway, it's an but, so... Yeah, so so his deal with with charter cities was: what if we just did like the Shanghai Bund, or what if we did any kind of other colonial enclave, and we had a more developed country operate as part of a less developed country in order to do entrepreneurship there? So my my understanding is it's essentially Paul Romer came up with the idea of what if instead of us making an excuse that imperialism was about the trains, we actually tried to make it about the trains, making him yeah. one of the world's biggest marks and idiots. Yeah, um, this one time we'll do it for real. Yeah, <laughs> let's get back band back together and make some trains. Now, this is declared un- unconstitutional by the Supreme Court to just give bits away at the country. So he does whatever any good you know, Latin American right wing strongman does and replaces the Supreme Court with his friends who immediately say it's good. So Romer and a bunch of liberal worthies all get together in a transparency commission where they cook up the idea. But after them, some hither and thither. Uh, Romer and all the worthies resign when they find out that the right wing strongman, uh, uh, sort of dictator of Honduras, doesn't want to actually get Germany's like rail minister to come in and you know build a bunch of um, um, train tracks on the island of Roatan. Well, there's there's a good reason for this. It's because if you if you have if you want a model for like giving away parts of your country to outside investors for entrepreneurship that is sort of like time tested and proven in Latin America. It's already there. You just do that business with corporations anyway. Mm. So um, it's, instead of like a state, instead of doing it with like I don't know some bunch of Christian Democrats from Baden-Württemberg or whatever, you, you just get you know some company that like sells fruit or whatever. Uh, yeah. So basically, and then so I'll turn back to, to Ian for this one. Right, a, a new oversight body called the Committee for the Adoption of Best Practices or CAMP is established. Now, Ian, can you tell me a little bit about? What Ooh. camp is? It's a committee. <laughs> sure. Yeah. It, camp was, I think, supposed to be kind of like you know these these uh, Zetas, the, uh, the the zones that like Prosper is one of. You know, they, they were supposed to be kind of semi autonomous, but camp was essentially the the connection to the government, which I think was sort of in response to the initial uh, invalidation of the Zeta law by the Supreme Court before um, uh, it was you know the the a certain set of justices were removed and others were put in place. Um, and so basically what they do is, uh, you know, when a, a Zeta like Prospero wants to, or what they're supposed to do, wants to, you know, uh, create a new regulation or law or thing like something like that, they have to get the approval of, of camp. So it's sort of, you know, government body 
Um, although, you know, it was not exactly, um, responsive to the people, but that way it was, you know, very much handpicked by, uh, uh, by, um, I guess I actually don't know if it was initially by Lobo and then whether, uh, his successor kept the same, I can't remember exactly, but, but they were basically supposed to be the sort of, um, uh, entity that ensures that what these cities are doing, uh, isn't like totally illegal under uh, Honduran constitutional law or isn't, you know, um, uh, isn't uh, a problem in some other way. I, I don't, I don't think they've, I, I think they, you know, for the people at Prosper told me is that there was actually some genuine back and forth about some stuff, but I, you know, I don't have a sense that they are um, a particularly hands-on, um, uh, you know, regulator or anything like that. So, so, so sort of a ground rules thing. You can't make the, uh, the mercenary Island from Far Cry three real. Um, <laughs> you, you, you can't try and like build, you know, experimental super weapons right. here or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No bombing in the well, pool. Stuff well, like that. well yeah. you would, you would think that. Um, <laughs> oh God. But, oh God. But, I, I hate when I, this is the worst subject about which I've ever done this thing that I always do. Right. Jokingly refer to t- a terrible thing and you go, uh, we'll get that. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, so we have this this thing established camp, and then you know, Romer says, oh, "I can't believe you're giving it to a corporation." I'm storming off, uh, essentially, um, and then uh, this the law then passes is then um, uh, is then sort of upheld by the next president um, Hernandez, who again campaigned heavily on the benefits of these Zetas. Uh, also, is like directly implicated in drug trafficking. I mean, he's been um, in, he's been indicted for it. I think he's being extradited yeah, he's, to the U.S. Yeah. Exactly, he is, he's been extradited. Is it a crime to, to hustle? <laughs> is it a crime to hustle and have a grind set? And is it a crime? I ask you to hustle large amounts of cocaine into the United States of America. <laughs> hmm. well, not if you're the CIA. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's true. Uh, and so, what happened was, and, and then in 2017, uh, this the first Zayday, uh, which become Prospera, was authorized by. By the camp, um, so then it was authorized in such a way as to be owned by this private company called Prosper Honduras Inc. So you go from this thing that Paul Romer has this idea for a charter city. Where this is what he says about it. He says it's the essence of the idea is the notion of a startup city. You have a chance to start a city anew. Um, and I think what's unusual about a startup city is that you can propose something new without having to go through a long process of consultation and agreement among people who might be affected by a change. With a startup city, you can propose something entirely new and let people choose where they want to live under its rules. People yeah, you want- can just build any mad thing <laughs> with your investors' money and then yeah. uh, see if anyone wants to live there. And if people don't like it, they can just leave, right? It's In that sense, it's sort of like a, a variation on like terra nullius, right? It, you can just do whatever you want, not because there's no one there, but because yeah. as informed consumers, the people who are already in the place where you want to do the thing, they can just move. Yeah. The great thing about the charter mm. cities is that there's a big door um, and uh, if you don't like it, <laughs> yeah, that's just, right. Just walk into the next yeah, one, yeah. and so you yeah, go. If you don't, if you don't like Prospera, you can always move to another normal city, like Neom, for example. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so he, it goes from this like Paul Romer idea to the ideas more aligned with uh, German weirdo Titus Gebel. Uh, <laughs> some, <laughs> some incredible name names. There's always in a German, so yeah. Far. There's always a German guy. I think every time we do one of these, there's always a German guy somewhere. Uh, yeah. uh, I loved the low budget German remake of the HBO series Rome, <laughs> <So>. <laughs> featuring Titus Gebel. So uh, he, one of the chief architects of the Prosper legal system, talked about how no, really, what this is all about is the private ownership of literally anything, but also enough political power that, and I'm quoting him here. That we can reserve the right not to admit, for example, criminals, communists, or Islamists. Um, I, w- were there a lot of Islamists in in Honduras? Uh, uh, maybe. <laughs> who, who can say? You know, it's, it's, it's sort of a sort of like uh, you know prayer mats at the border kind of hysteria. Yeah, absolutely. We were worried about that. Um, uh, that that one. We were crazy worried conspiracy. that the plot of Sicario Three was going to happen to our beautiful island. Um, oh. So you might be wondering who sits on this uh, on the committee for the adoption of uh, best practices. Um, I mean, oh, a bunch of guys with names, probably. Uh, so mm. they're ad- they're appointed by the government. Salvador Himmler. Uh, <laughs> again, again, Milo, you're not far oh, off. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, they promised they would get in some German experts. I guess they weren't lying in the end. Experts in what? Don't worry about. Who's on the committee for the adoption of best practices? Uh, who are just these like figurative arist not real aristocrats they're figurative aristocrats because they just re they can just reappoint themselves and the list was only made public one time in a presentation towards the beginning of the Zed. Uh, so again, this is the 
pretend aristocracy of um, of the camp. These people who are basically there to say um, adjudicate on any rules that the zone creates. Number one, Archduchess Gabriella von Habsburg, <laughs> <laughs> awesome. uh, who's an abstract sculptor and the ambassador of Georgia to Germany, and also a member of Liberty Roadshow. Number two, Grover Norquist. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I really? appreciate the fact that the, the Bay Islands will have a strong pro-vapor influence. <laughs> <laughs> they do. I mean, you know what? We need to move on. To, uh, it, it can't be an extractive economy. It can't be a tourist economy. It needs to be a vaping economy. <laughs> and uh, who better to do that than Grover Norquist? That's true. Well, Michael, I am Ronald Reagan's son, Reagan. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> Dr. Barbara Colm, the uh, ch- wife of Matthew Elliott from Vote Leave, uh, but a, one of the free market roadshow and taxpayer alliance people. Um, oh, great. Kaja Ben Dukidze, a post Soviet Georgian businessman who from 2004 to 8 uh, was the Minister of Coordination for Economic Reforms and declared that he was trying to sell everything in Georgia but its conscience. And his goal, he said, was to close down his own ministry and demolish the state. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> um, Morton Blackwell, a special assistant to Ronald Reagan, who was involved in the swift boating of John Kerry in 2004. Uh, Lars Sire Christensen, the founder of Saxo Bank and a Danish tycoon. Alejandro Schaufen, Saxo banked it. <laughs> uh, one of the world's leading commentators in economic thought of Thomistic and late scholastic th- thinkers, and a member of the advisory board of the Social Affairs Unit in the UK, and a member of the Mont Bellerin Society. I'm, be- I'm, I'm being like stunlocked here. I'm just like absorbing a series of blows. <laughs> I feel I- like. Yeah, I feel like a lot of these guys are sort of people who really wanted to be in the Epstein Black Book, but didn't quite get there. So they sort of have the characters and they have the outlines, but like they're missing something. Mm-hmm. And perhaps this is like the alternative to like the Epstein Island. Imagine like, getting blackballed from being a nonce. Let me ask you this question. Were these people just brought on because of the sort of like a, you know, I'll be a board member of whatever if you pay me enough money kind of thing? Or do you feel like there this was this ideological hodgepodge of people all really intensely agreed on this one idea and actually like cared a lot about it because like the idea of Grover Norquist and a Habsburg and some vote leave freaks from the UK, like you feel as though that's a a thing where they're like, they're like a, it's like a paperboard kind of thing. That would be my best guess. But like uh, Grover, why do we need this 500 square foot vaping pavilion? (laughs) (laughs) And then Grover Norquist says to the horse and the rabbi. <laughs> I'd like to know what, what Ian thinks of this as well, but my sense is that everyone involved in this is ready to lose a lot of time and money. They just want to be right, and they're really dedicated to the idea of trying to make a pretty stateless society. Like, what do you think, Ian? Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think a lot of the, the people who have been drawn to this, both uh, you know, with the, looking at the list uh, for camp, and I, I don't know how many of those people are still actively involved, but, um, but looking at that initial list and then the kinds of people who are actually trying to, uh, you know, build these, say, like the Prospero folks. I mean, they're all people who I think wish it were, you know, 1980 and not sort of the end of that sort of neoliberal uh, economic libertarian era. And I think they kind of see that that, uh, you know, that moment is starting to, to fade or at least change into something else in uh, Europe and in the U.S. And so I think there's, I mean, there's always been this kind of look abroad, you know, sort of the, the neo-colonial aspect of this. But I think there's now this sense that, like, you know, if our, our project has a future, it's it's perhaps on, you know, some, uh, uh, some you know, foreign soil of some kind. Yeah. Well, Go I to the sea. I, also, I mean, that was, that well, yeah, was yeah, the thing for all, sea stepping. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, they're yeah. involved, too. Yep, yep. But, but, I, but, I, but I, also, I also find it very, I guess, telling in a way that they found a pliant government, but they also found a location where it, like, they wouldn't be doing this in like the Atlantic coast parts of Nicaragua. They wouldn't be doing this in like the Mosquito Coast. They wouldn't right. be doing this in like in like Gracias a Dios uh, Darien province. 2.0 would be uh, very in, funny. In, Hond- in Honduras for a variety of reasons. But there is something to me where like when you mentioned that the uh, reading your article that there was effectively a co-working space is sort of like the, the metropole of this society. <laughs> the thought crossed my mind like, yeah, but there are like eco-tourist backpackers, people like that who go to, to, to Roatan. Um, and it feels like there's an element of... I don't know. They, it it kind of makes sense why you have a government as unstable and corrupt as Honduras is, but then you also have a place that's sort of got like a kind of tourist appeal to it that you can maybe get gullible people to go there. Whereas I can't imagine that like if you did this in Bluefields, Nicaragua, that like people would just be you know ch- just beating down the door to get a chance to go get out there. 
I'm just imagining, like, um, you know, a sort of intrepid explorer discovering the ruins of Prosper in like a thousand years. It's all like <laughs> overgrown with vines and just going like, we believe that this table was a focal point of their society. <laughs> Here they played the now lost game, which we believe was called Pong Ping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the loser of Pong Ping is like ritually sacrificed, of course. <laughs> yeah. There are a few more fun members of the camp. Uh, one is a Peruvian economist and another Mon Palo and society member called Enrique Garci, who wrote a book called The Other Path, The Economic Answer to Terrorism, uh, with Hernando de Soto. The uh, incredible. Path. Yeah. <laughs> the completely uh, non-shiny. There is also, uh, it was led by a Honduran at the time named Mark Klugman. Um, oh. <laughs> very, very, very Honduran surname right my, there. Yeah. My uh, grandfather came over from Switzerland. <laughs> Switzerland. Um, Richard Ron, who, another member of the Mont Pelerin Society, and also Peggy Noonan's ex husband. Uh, the, and the Mont Pelerin Society in itself is already like a big club for nerds to jack each other off about markets. Does it so still exist? I'm, I, I didn't realize that it was like still a thing. I think so. Oh, well, okay. I no, think, I mean, it must be I if these guys are members of it. Yeah, but it's, I, uh, I thought it was just like a moment in the early to mid 20th century but well i mean look it's 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 like uh, uh the velvet underground you know everyone <laughs> no one joined the mont Pelerin society but everyone who is in it founded an ill and sort of ill-fated uh, intentional community <laughs> um then there's mark skousen who's i include only because he was inspired to get into right-wing economics by his uncle prominent john bircher named cleon skousen um it, it just, you just dug out all of the names in this story oh yeah i'm front-loading the names and the last one is lauren a smith who you may know as nixon's defense attorney after watergate <laughs> d d just a perfect a perfect cabal of weirdos fantastic yeah. and so basically right how it works in a nutshell is as we said there's this zone that's picked by the honduran government that accompanies sort of zone of alienation <laughs> you can hire a stalker to take you in there in pursuit of your own dreams it, well if your dreams are to open a bitcoin education center then yes you can do that <laughs> yeah, and whose wouldn't be <laughs> yeah uh, so how it works in a nutshell as i understand it is that there's this area administered by the honduran government as like sort of outside of honduras in not a criminal sense but in like a civil law sense and a private company comes in and administers basically a set of contracts um you sign a contract to live and prosper that's sort of like an nap uh, and then you can invest in the private company, and then they have a tax that they pay to pay off their private investors. Um, and so you, if you want to be a resident of Prospera, you have to pay $260 a year if you're Honduran, or $1,300 if you're not, to become a resident. Um, and so all, already, you might say, huh, and it's, uh, in, in, in Roatan, where the, annu or the cost of, monthly cost of living for a family of three, uh, everything, is about $800. Um, I, that does seem like a, something of a substantial expense. Um, yeah, if, if if like a significant amount of your money is like going on your your citizenship fees for this libertarian community. Um, and then, and and, and so that that's that's sort of the the, the situation, right? But the, then they've made they got thirty million of of of, money, of funding in their first round from Pronomos Capital. More on them later. And then they expect to make the rest of the thirty million when they inevitably make the land around Prospera to be incredibly valuable. And yes, of course, there was a land value tax because the specter of Georgism is never far away from a crazy idea for a new city. <laughs> Although, um, of course, you know, we should we should point out that like most libertarian projects, you know, the, the charges to live there sound expensive, but they do operate a kids go free policy. <laughs> so and it's actually cheaper than it sounds. The thing, the thing is, all of this land is like economically worthless, being as it is merely beautiful island. Uh, it, you know, what it needs instead is Bitcoin farms. Yeah, yeah those, there are no beanbags on it. Like, yeah. Yeah, what exactly. Were being bags. Yeah, and so you know, we could ask, right? Like, um, who who actually like lives there, and how does it work, right? As far as I can tell, right? And and you know, you've actually been there, uh, uh, Ian. So you sort of probably know a little bit better. Um, but I've seen estimates that like about thirty Hondurans and then the Prosper employees themselves live there. Does that seem about right to you? Yeah. Uh I'm, so that sounds like that sounds right for the, sort of the number of people who seem to be yeah kind of working there. But unless they and they may have built a lot more housing since I was there, but there certainly wasn't enough housing at the time uh, uh, unless they converted part of that main building into you know uh, apartments or something, which I can't imagine was possible. I mean, they had like four of these little modular houses, which could you know plausibly I think um, uh, you know house I guess four people or. Maybe a little bit more, but not many more than that. And they may have, they may have built many more. I mean, they're they're nice. I mean, they're not, they weren't bad, but they're just not not very big. 
Um, uh, and so, yeah, I, I, it's possible they built a lot more, but it, it, certainly when I was there, there was not the, you know, just living space for that many people to live there, to so work there, sure. Like, but, uh, sort of a handful of people. When this was when this was initially created, Ian, was this just like agricultural land or sort of like you, you, you know, common common land that, that people lived on, or was it like unoccupied and the, the people who wound up living there were drawn to it because of the job opportunities or things along those lines? Yes, it was more that was the latter, really. So they they bought the land from a, a family that I guess I think was from Roatan, but most of them had moved to the U.S. Um, gotcha. at this point, and they just had this. You know, they, I think they had been sort of a fairly you know, large landholder on, on the Island. Um, and one of their like nephews or something works, works with them now, but, um, yeah, they sold, they, yeah, they sold this chunk of land, um, to them. And then th- there really wasn't anything there. It's, you know, kind of like a, uh, you know, sort of leafy hillside heading down into the ocean. Um, but right next door to it essentially is, is there is a, um, a small sort of fishing village that, um, isn't part of, uh, prosper, but I'm sure we'll, we'll get to to you later, but but they they're not uh, they're at least for what they've done so far uh, they're not um, uh, they're they're not lying or anything when they say they were just kind of on a unoccupied site there wasn't really anyone living there. Gotcha. Okay. So I think we could um, so we sort of understand like the the group of people who live in Prospera a small number of like Hondurans and the like Americans who mostly work for Prosper Honduras Inc. Um, and then we could also ask right like okay well um, what kinds of like jobs are people actually doing there right so. Um, most of the people who work there work for a business called Prospera Employment Solutions, which basically just acts as a kind of outsourcing um, provider for like educated Hondurans doing quite ordinary remote jobs for American companies. But and they say they have about eleven hundred people registered to them. But if only thirty people live in Prospera, and anyone can work for this company, then really what that means is that a whole bunch of unless I get this wrong is that a whole bunch of Hondurans who live in Honduras are working for this company that's sort of not really in Honduras where you don't have a lot of rights as an employee uh, in order to uh, sell cheap uh, cheap overseas labor uh, to American companies. Uh, so the roles that they have advertised are like a sales role at a real estate company doing lease renewals, actuary work for an insurance... I actually went on their job board and I, I picked some examples. Actuary work for an insurance company that sells like car warranties, HR support for a software company, a remote personal assistant, quite far away from what Prospero was really intended to be which was this city without rules that would be the type that would, I think in their words, revolutionize technology, medicine, and robotics, right? It's just quite ordinary. So basically, they were going to build neo-colonial island Atlantis on the blockchain, and instead they have a call center. Uh, that's what it would seem. And what's very funny... Except, not, except without the call center part. You have the supervisory <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. bit of the call center. It's, it's, it's a VPN node for the call center. The call center is in Tegucigalpa. That seems like more or less what it would be. Um, so, like, um, for example, one other thing I think is very funny, you talk about the VPN node for the call center, is that I have looked at brochure after brochure, website after website. I've looked at so much Prospera material, and I've realized that they tr- like they want to like take... There's so many pictures that they've taken of their one building from different angles to sort of lightly <laughs> imply that there's more than one building, which is very amusing. Which is just this co-working space that mostly is worked in by people who work for Prospera, but there are a few companies. Yeah, it's got like six different sides. Yeah, but there are a few companies um, that are sort of trying to set up there. Uh, there is, and, and you cite this in the article, Ian, uh, a gene therapy clinic called Mini Circle, run by a man named Machiavelli Davis. I figured this out. I figured this out. You know what this is? This is a hitman level. Like the armed guards, yeah, if they yeah, all have yeah. like the shared uniform, there's a bunch of like big sort of chests lying around. Um, they're, they're all on really fixed patrol routes. Yeah, no, this is what it is. Forty-seven. Your task is to eliminate the gene therapist, <laughs> Machiav- Machiavelli Davis. Come on. Un- unsurprisingly, he goes by Mac. <laughs> <Did I> <laughs> <laughs> well, I sure hope I can trust my gene therapy doctor, <laughs> Mac Davis. I really hope that isn't short for anything evil. Yeah, his uh, hell is like covering part of his name tag on his lab coat, and you're just like, hey, oh, I wouldn't worry about that. Uh, and so, like, M- Mini Circle, what they do is they, like, again, have, like, quite controversial gene therapies that are like, look, the testing regimen in the US and the UK or whatever, it's too onerous. They make some, you do too many trials. Countries 
countries won't let you just inject billionaires with like child blood. And that's why you need a sort of a more entrepreneur friendly mm. regulatory environment. Here in Prospera, they're not even legally a child. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a, like, a drone delivery co uh, company that, again, like, there's nothing to deliver or no one to deliver it to, but there's a drone delivery company. Well, that's how drone delivery companies work best, in my experience. <laughs> Are you going to tell me it's like, yeah, the, the drone delivery company it flies, you know, from Roatan to mainland Honduras does, to do yes. Amazon, Amazon Ursat's deliveries is run by a guy named Clausewitz Jones or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a bank called Seshat Bank, which is annoyingly actually just trying to make a more effective bank, it seems. I was... I, I was so I excited when they do real see, business. Yeah, it actually seems to be a real business, which is very <laughs> annoying. Um, and then the mm. most interesting it's run one, by Enron Bernie Madoff. <laughs> <laughs> the most interesting one, which is called Pristine Bay Golf Club. And the owner, because what you can do with Prospera, right, is anyone who owns a business in Honduras can declare themselves to be part of Prospera. Um, and so the owner joined his golf club to Prospera, which is nearby. In a medieval sort of dynastic marriage, he has saddled them with a golf course. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it, essentially, yeah, in, in, in a medieval sort of dynastic marriage, he has traded a golf course to a Habsburg for a permanent seat on the city council, which, by the way, they are able to give him in exchange for his golf course joining the jurisdiction. Yeah, and I think it's like hotel, a hotel there too, right? It's like a little resort. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think it was like, yeah, I, when I was there, they hadn't uh, bought it yet, but um, that place was struggling financially. So I, I know there were talk about that being likely. And so what happened, right? The other thing, this raises one of the core questions of like why, what, how this whole thing works, right? Because uh, presumably a bunch of people work at that hotel. Are they all of a sudden going to pay like their... Um, two hundred and sixty dollars to be residents of Prospera, but they're working for a no, company. Of course not. They're going to be migrant laborers, but in a country that like just started existing like down the road from them, uh, and that their boss just elected to be part of, which you can do. Uh, you could do that in mainland Honduras. You don't need to be in Roatan if you want. You can be anywhere. And they have, in fact, uh, in La Ceiba, there's a, a big chunk of land that they uh, incorporated into like Pro a Prospera hub city or whatever they call it. They want to be Hong Kong, and they want Laseba to be Shenzhen, as far as I understand. <laughs> yeah, yep. Um, and so they, the idea, right, though, is that this hotel is now able to choose its own tax jurisdiction after a few years, um, and also is politically uh, involved in the running of Prospera. I actually went into the filings, and this is one of the um, points on the, uh, on, on the bill of sale, which is, the promoter and organizer, which is Prosper Honduras Inc., warrants to the owner of the hotel that it will exercise all its powers and prerogatives under the Prospera Charter to have one of the seats in the Prospera Council of Trustees filled by a representative of the owner of the, owner of the hotel. <laughs> it's literally Amazing. in the law. It's a little fiefdom, you know? It's like, it's like a sort of, like, um, like a bishopric in the Holy Roman Empire, you know? It's, it, you, you have a seat on the council, like, by right. Mm, absolutely. I'm gonna I'm gonna buy a petrol station on the A12 and designate it the Romford Autonomous Zone <laughs> and then join it to Prospera. Um, and uh, you, we say also like earlier, right? You know, other other projects going on include I don't know if this has started. Well, you were there, Ian. Uh, the Duna Tower, which is a 13-story mixed-use commercial tower in the Roatan jungle, um, where studio apartments start at four hundred dollars. Which again, a f average living cost on the island for a family of three is eight hundred dollars. Um, is that to buy or rent? What are we talking? Uh, that's like uh, no, like to rent. You can rent. You like, can't buy the, That's 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 would be very libertarian of them to sell something to you when they could rent it to you. Um, oh, yes, of course. Yes, yeah, so you get a studio apartment for four hundred dollars a month, uh, or half the cost of living for a family of three. Yeah, and all you have to do is live in the jungle. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, in a sort of libertarian tower block. Yeah, well, that is like the shortage mm. of Honduras. So you know, you've got to pay. You've yeah. got to pay the premium for it. So the they're opening a, a filial of uh, Bally Ballers. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, yeah. Well, one thing also about that that uh, you know about the approach to the place is you have to drive. So it's like there's a turnoff from like the main road that runs along the uh, the island right next to this big shopping center, like the Mega Plex or something like that. And then it's just like this dirt road that goes up and down these hills. And it's the, the most rutted road I've ever driven on. I've lived in some pretty rural places. And like when it rains, it's just undrivable. It just completely like destroys the road. They keep, you know, the government keeps talking about paving it, but it hasn't happened uh, after 10 years of promises. Um, so it's not exactly an easy place to get to is the other thing. Um, it's, uh, it's like sort of borderline uh, inaccessible at certain times of year. So. so what we're saying is it's like a WeWork that 
again, you, as Alice said earlier, you really can't get to. It's yeah. like a mm. yeah. It's a, a we really commit to getting into work. Um, yeah. And I, I have I actually am the master plan of Prosper in front of me. And like any good libertarian uh, community, it has it's uh, the only building that really exists up at the top. It has then some high quality residences up at the top. A bunch yeah, of a bunch like, of mysterious a mysterious little sort of blue and white temple for some reason. <laughs> Not sure what that's about. Well, it has the uh, Bayabu residences by Zaha Hadid, who's basically oh and again you cite this. It, I mean, she's involved in every like her aesthetic has become the intentional libertarian community aesthetic. But again, Ian, in your article, you talk about like how it is a kind of like Sim City almost, where you can like pay $5,000 to reserve your dream home in the north coast of Roatan, designed by Zaha Hadid. Yeah, yeah and you can, I mean, it's, it's like modular. You can go in there and, in, in theory, at least like kind of like, you know, uh, tinker with sort of what the interior of your apartment or house would look like and uh, sort of mix and match. And I think the big driver there was after Zaha Hadid herself died is, uh, what's his name? Uh, Shoemaker, Patrick Shoemaker, the German, uh, mm, yeah, yeah. big libertarian guys. And he's been very heavily... Um, Heavily involved, but yeah, I mean, it's. I don't think any of that stuff is anywhere near, at least as I understand it, being being built. Oh, but, oh. Yeah. I have the dates when oh, the ba- yeah. when the when the Bayobu Hotel modular residences are supposed to be like open for business. They're supposed to be constructed from January and then open in next March. Uh, this has not happened. This has not come close to happening. I, I do find it very funny that they decided they're going to build libertarian bossing say from Avatar, <laughs> but they forgot to build a road, and so it's just like. Damn it! Fuck. Liber- libertarians and their greatest nemesis once again, Rhodes. <laughs> uh, that at the bottom of this like long, skinny um, uh, 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 city that goes along the coast, and then sequestered across a river is low cost homes. So they have uh, are, are the low are the low cost homes beautiful Zaha Hadid uh, style dwellings? Mm, in a word. The, well, I mean, the thing is, they're exactly the same in as much as as many of them exist as one another. But uh, no, they are supposed to be uh, less nice. So otherwise, how would you work? Yeah. What, what, what do they look like? Are we talking like a lesser Zaha Hadid? Do you just get like a bit of sort of like angular concrete? Or what are we talking it's, about? It's sort of a square. It's, it seems like a square building. I've actually seen a picture of a couple that have been built. And it's just like a square building with a small window and a door. It's, it's not much. Uh, but it's like made of wood. It's not a shipping container. No, yeah, I was I, I was in a couple. Of, I think it's like the similar to those that was like labeled the beta residence, but it's these yeah, these sort of modular the beta residence. Uh, I would hate to uh, be forced yeah. to live in the beta residence. Right. Well, I guess they, I think they just call it Texas, like they're you know beta testing of it or something like that. But um, mm. but uh, uh, you know, yeah, they, I mean, they, they were nice enough, but uh, yeah, they're they're not big, but they're they're sort of meant to be modular. We could modify them, and I mean, it's not like a not a crazy idea, but it's not uh, yeah, it's not exactly luxury living. So. We can also ask, right? We, we sort of have an idea, I think, of the physicality and the economy of this place, right? It's supposed to be this, you know, um, place where the future will be invented. And like so many of those places, it's a, sort of a call center uh, with some buildings that you can't really get to, uh, but it's sort of enormously flashy investor presentations that people keep dumping money. So much money has been dumped into this thing by people who want to make a point. Um, so we can ask, like, who's actually behind all of this? Um, The big guy, and we're going to come back to him quite a bit, is a man named Eric Bryman, who was uh, born in Venezuela before then (laughs) going to uh, Babson College, working at Brown Brothers Harriman, and then eventually starting a social impact investing fund called New Way Capital to quote unquote promote growth in Latin America, to which I can say a lot of alumni of Brown Brothers Harriman Uh (laughs) have done a lot of different things to quote unquote promote growth in Latin America. Um, That's true. Yes. (laughs) So he's, what, are you going to drop something on us like Manuel Noriega is an alumnus or something like that? Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, So uh, he's also joined by Gabriel Delgado, uh, a tech guy from Guatemala whose parents started their own university with a giant mural dedicated to uh, Ayn Rand on it. Um, the president of Prospera, Prospera Honduras International, Joel Baumgar, uh, who is an extremely conservative Mississippi state legislator. So they've just like scoured two continents for the worst freaks and dipshits they could find 
And then uh, the, 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 they've gone all in on building a little island. Mm. Again, building a co-working space on a little island, mostly. B- building a little co-working space yeah. and possibly some like small but maybe quite nice houses. It's, um, it's Suicide Squad for building a shite co-working space. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also involved was a, a, a guy and who comes up in your article quite a bit, who I want to get to soon, uh, Tristan Monteroso, who is an evangelical priest from Roatan. a great name. And a friend of Bryman's from military school, who was like the main oh. driver who to encourage him to invest, and was also the ambassador essentially to the nearby town of Crawfish Rock. Um, and then finally, uh, the investors have included Pro- Pronomos Capital, which is a joint venture between Peter Thiel, Mark Andreessen, and then Milton Friedman's grandson Patrick. There we go. What is with all of the fail sons in this? We've got Reagan's kid. We've got Milton Friedman's kid. We've got uh, like a sort of late stage Habsburg. I I don't understand it. Stage five Habsburg. Right, yeah. right, right, right. I'm sorry, madam. We can't save you. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a welfare policy for those guys' kids. Yeah. Oh, yeah. absolutely. It, it feels that way. I mean, it's this is this feels to me like like if you are so flooded with coke money, C K O C. Well, <laughs> kind of both. <laughs> it's a double entendre. It's not legally actionable. Um, mm. I mean, I mean, like the you know the origin story does definitely sound like something that you would have like you would come up with after like a big night doing a lot of coke. Like, what <laughs> if we created like an island where everyone worked at Salesforce? Um, and lived in like weird <laughs> cubicles. Yeah, see, I was gonna say that this sounds like like a William Faulkner novel written by Wes Anderson, but like <laughs> malevolent, like really, really malevolent. What is, what is this kind of libertarian city, but a small plates country? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I have a theory about what this, what exactly this is. Once Riley gets to the way this is governed internally, I mean, I'll, oh, I'll, I'll and then Pronomos's website just quickly said it wants to see quote crowd choice and governance provision. Um, with new mm. startup societies and completely new developments in unclaimed areas such as the high seas or the celestial bodies. <laughs> <laughs> we got to find a frontier and we're going to find one somewhere. <laughs> These prosper ladies got celestial bodies. We're going to establish a Bitcoin education center on the surface of the sun. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Why not? And, and, and just before I, I carry on, I want to remember one other business. Which is that there was this like Czech libertarian who was super into the idea of being a brewer, and there's a mm-hmm. oddly there's like a long history of Czechs living on Roatan, and so a Czech brewery right beside Prospera went up for sale. So he was going to buy it and join it to Prospera, but then Joel Baumgar convinced him to not do a brewery, but instead make it a Bitcoin education center. <laughs> Oh my god! Just in case they were amazing. about I know, to do a real thing. This is too tangible. This is too tangible. You have to do some nonsense instead. <laughs> Just being like, this is what a Bitcoin is. This speaks to his like power of charisma, though, because you do have to work quite hard to get a check under any circumstances to not brew beer. <laughs> they love doing it. <laughs> yeah, they often do it without even noticing. You just have to yeah. point it out to them. It's like a tick. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, why, why, why are you sort of like perched on top of this big keg? And it's like, what? Did this come from? <laughs> what are you talking about? Um, <laughs> And then I also have this, so I want to sort of move into a little bit about the relationship between Bryman, Prospera, and Crawfish Rock. And I want to start by doing a little table setting. Uh, this is a quote I captured from Bryman on a podcast, talking about why Honduras. He says, I think in the case of Honduras, it's been a combination of enlightenment by a handful of reformers that really and passionately want the best for their country, such as that Habsburg, um, with dire conditions and a very high degree of need for something different to emerge. The local population recognizes that it's not conducive to good economic activity if they are protesting on the grounds or disrupting the general sense of security. There's a self-correcting nature to how the local population thinks about how to deal with things that, hey, it's not perfect here, but they know they're shooting themselves in the foot if they seek to solve problems through large-scale political unrest. Oh, that's grim. That's really grim. That Mm. makes me want them to solve problems through large-scale political unrest. Um, And this is something I kind of noticed, and so I turned to Ian here as well, right? This is something I kind of noticed about Bryman, which is that he really does seem to like to say something with a sort of smile that does sound threatening when you just read it out. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. No, he's, I mean, he's an interesting and complicated figure, but like he and Delgado given sort of like, you know, I I kind of see, I can see, I can see from their sort of upbringings, how they came to this, came to find this idea appealing. And then obviously also sort of the ideological stuff from their background. But uh, yeah, he's, 
he, he's a Delgado is much more the charmer, like uh, uh, Bremen's the, the business, the sort of strictly business kind of guy. I mean, he's very nice. He's not he's not not like a uh, you know sort of uh, mean guy or anything, but uh, at least it wasn't in my experience. But um, but yeah, he, he I have seen videos um, of him uh, talking to locals where yeah, it's kind of like you know. He gets a, a lot nice more. Nice village you've got yeah. here. It'd be a shame if anything happened to it, kind of thing. Yeah, not, not all of it made it into the piece, but but yeah, there were some some uh, videos with like his. We'll get to this stuff later, but it's this local council in that village, Crawfish Rock, where he's, um, you know, yeah, it is kind of like the, you know, smile on the face while sort of um, being quite, uh, uh, you know, sort of literally, you know, nice village you've got here. It'd be a shame if something yeah. happened. The local residents don't want to shoot themselves in the foot, and I certainly wouldn't want to have to shoot any of them in any part of their body. So I think it's good that we all do things to prevent that from happening. <laughs> it's cool that a guy who like may, does maybe having an intentional community somewhere like this just make you act more like a Bond villain, or is it just people who already act like Bond villains who seek out these intentional communities? I mean, sort of anyone like some question. free punch? Yeah. <laughs> After the talk is completed. I mean, I think he, he, he and Delgado really believe this stuff. I mean, that's, you know, they, uh, they believe that, you know, uh, rational actor theory describes the way the world works. And if they just sort of create the right incentives for property rights, I mean, they really, I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't see any sort of sign that they were kind of like, you know, in the way they say the Cokes or something are kind of like, yeah, we love libertarianism as long as it, you know, means the government does stuff to help only us. Uh, it was, they seem like true believers in it. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, Seems way worse. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's 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 almost more um, more likely to cause mischief in some ways. I, think. I, I also feel like there's just something to be said for that quote that you you brought up, Riley, about you know that they want to find a way to discourage locals from political disruption. You know, using that euphemism, because like political disruption is not exactly an easy thing to do in a society like Honduras, specifically in Honduras, where, I mean, I think, I don't think we've talked about Berta Caceres on this show before, but like there's a famous story in the last, it was in 2016 of a in, indigenous activist, uh, like an environmental activist in Honduras being murdered. Um, it seems like the state was involved or at least aware of the plan to do it. Um, you know, you don't, it's just a country where there aren't really labor protections where they're, you know, where the average working person's lot is basically to work for so little that like, they don't really have any hope of owning much more than, you know, a phone charger for a $20 phone. Like it's a really, really grim situation. And so like, I just, there's something in that cavalierness uh, about saying, Hey, I, um, you know, I, we, we, we basically want to, 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 to let people know that like life can never get better unless we dictate exactly how it's going to work. It's a self. It's a self-correcting problem. It just. It just really. Yeah. It really. That creeps me out a lot. Um, and maybe it's just because of the fact that, like, having seen what conditions are like for everyday people in that country on the mainland. Um, and then, and I don't know, uh, Ian, if you if you you have any thoughts on that, but just like I think the the contrast being so stark between that kind of like callousness versus like what the circumstances are like for people for working people in Honduras that really creeps me out. Yeah, I think there's. I mean, that's one of the sort of big, I mean, setting aside the sort of you know, morality and everything of it all, you know, just like practically speaking, they have a very, what strikes me as a very sort of distorted view of what the situation is for ordinary people uh, in Honduras. And I mean, it makes sense when they go there, they stay in these, you know, they were staying in like a, you know, one of the sort of like all inclusive kind of resorts, um, you know, populated by Americans. And all, right. So they're not, and, and also Roatan is, is a much, much economically better off as I understand it than, than the mainland. So it's a, a bit different uh and then they have ambitions to spread to the mainland so that you know they'd have to contend with that eventually but yeah i think it's very much a sort of classic like you know uh r- like rich guy misunderstanding of like what ordinary people's lives are like i mean and in fact that quote is a good example like, people protest there all the time they're very politically engaged yeah, like it's yeah, not absolutely. yeah including on the island i mean honduras generally as well but like it's not like a it's not a place where people are afraid to, to speak their minds so Speaking, like, sort of coming into sort of what you were talking about, specifically about the relationship between Prospera and Crawfish Rock, on Prospera, there is a sign that says, Prospera, providing running, providing you running water since 2019. <laughs> Can you explain this vaguely threatening sign? Yeah, yeah. So this, this it's, it's a, basically the, the situation. It's a little bit, like, complicated, so I'll, I'll try to keep it simple. But they'd had a sort of water source in the this fishing village um, next door Crawfish Rock. And somehow there was some issue with the, like, I, I was, the, I can't remember exactly the electricity bill or some, somehow it sort of stopped working. Uh, and, uh, 
part of the sort of, you know, um, and I think, you know, at the start seemed as far as I could tell somewhat genuine, at least, you know, sort of the idea of like, oh, you know, we have this water source on our prosper as next door. We, we will you know provide you water. Um, they were a little surprised in, in the village when they got a bill, a monthly bill for it. Libertarian. <laughs> yeah, yeah of course, right. Exactly. Well, yeah, I mean, they're, they're quite explicit about, I think there's one of the interviews uh, with the local media, Berman was said something along those lines of like, you know, we don't believe in a dependence mentality or this are classic sort of libertarian point of view. Mm. Um, yeah, no, no yeah. free lunch. Um, very yeah. close, literally, to do not become addicted to water. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I actually have a man and electricity and yeah. you electrify for a day but yeah. teach a man to electricity <laughs> i have the quote here it's that bryman explained that prospera generally doesn't believe in charity as a primary source of support because it right. creates dependencies so yeah. instead of creating a dependency on you what we're going to do is we're going to bill you for the water which yeah. by the way we control all of make you dependent on us right yeah um yeah so they, they and the, to, to be fair when uh the pandemic started, they did stop. They stopped billing them, uh, uh, for that, that time period. But, uh, British almost, <laughs> but, uh, but then the, the, uh, I guess eventually what happened was there was a sort of clash between some of the folks that were aligned with, uh, with, uh, Prospera in Crawfish Rock and, and the people who were kind of opposed to it. And, um, ultimately, you know, it's a little unclear. The prosper people say that the, the sort of local leaders asked them to stop providing water because they were going to get it fixed through sort of working with local politicians. Uh, the, the, the people uh, who the prosper folks say said that have a very different account of it, which is that they, they, they said, yeah, we're going to get around water source, but they didn't say turn off our water in 30 days, um, which ultimately uh, did happen. And then I think about a month later, they got uh, the government kind of got water. Moving in some fashion again, um, uh, either got their the village's system working. Or I can't remember the exact details, but uh, but yeah, it was it was the kind of thing that you know um, uh, predictable, I guess, in in <laughs> in, uh, in hindsight, or, or should have been predictable. But I think if you you know if you believe some of the stuff that these guys believe, um, you sort of think people will behave differently, and and and, and thank you for uh, you know for uh, giving them the privilege of paying you for water. <laughs> Thank you for making me not uh, dependent on a handout. Well, uh, I am sort of yeah, um, you know, sitting below Immortan Joe's big citadel. I think that the well, relationship we between- always enjoy on this podcast is we find that you can fit all the things we talk about onto a kind of like a four corner matrix where the two axes are evil and stupid. Um, mm. And I feel as though this is kind of sitting in the evil and stupid quadrant. Mm-hmm.